Hello to you all. So quite a few people listen later or they listen through the YouTube and some have asked uh, to, to wave at their presence today, which is all great. So I will just in short discuss what we did last time to just be uh, um, in line with what we have done. We've started to discuss this concept of Or and Kali, which means enlightenment or light from Hashem, from God, and the vessel that we prepare. And we call it in a different form, Chomer Vetsua, which means matter and the shape, which means the matter will always be the physical vessel, the physical vessel that we are holding in this world. And the shape, the shape of it will always be that personality, that essential self that we give into itself. So for example, when we see, when we say, for example, a truthful person or a very brave person, right? We don't speak about the physical shape of that person, obviously. We're speaking about the personality which shines through that essence that we see through the physicality. And we discussed the fact that the two ways serve each other, in other words, I can become a new personality through doing physical actions again and again. A person is not a very kind person, more stingy, more selfish. And by doing actions of kindness with others, slowly can become and accommodate becoming a better person. The other way around, a person is very brave, has got the strength of character, even though he might have been sent to this world with kind, some kind of dis-ease, some kind of ailment, some kind of a financial setback or circumstance or family or wherever he was born. And nevertheless, even though he's starting somewhere at the back from his perspective, he's going to be very successful because of his strength of character, because of his fighting spirit, which it is. And therefore, when I speak to you now, to each one of the participants, I'm not speaking to your physical body shape. I'm speaking to you always to your spiritual self, which gives me the inkling of who you are. We know each other because of our physical form, because of our personality, which is which forms our physical, our personal reality, not because of how we look, this or that. The physical is only will be a vessel of carrying who we are. Why do we look the way we look? So some of us do know that panim in Hebrew, the word face, comes from the word panim, which means which I discussed with one of you at least this week, which means this shows the internal self as you are. And over and above this, through our physical action, this world, we form who we become, our spiritual reality. Even though we do not change in our physical form in this lifetime, but if we elevate ourselves or we corrupt ourselves in this life, in our actions, in the next reincarnation, we will be formed according to our actions now. This is mind boggling, but this is the truth. So we don't judge anyone. But I will give you an example with a nice story from the Chofetz Chaim. A father came to him rushing into his study, into his office, let's call it an office, into his home, some 60, 70 years back, crying, crying out loud. He said, why are you crying, mister? I don't know you. So said, well, I just had a baby born, a baby born. It's my first one. He said, you should be very sympathetic. You should be very much in happiness because you're going to have a bris milah in eight days. He said, yes, but I have a problem, an issue. He said, what is your challenge, sir? He said, my baby was sent from higher worlds with art two hands. He's missing his two hands. So the Chofetz Chaim, who had Holy Spirit, went into his deep thought and into his humility, and he said to the father as follows, let me tell you the scenario which I think, which obviously is the truth, because he had Holy Spirit, of what happened to your child in the previous life. In the previous lifetime, your child did, who was a complete adult, he did whatever he did. He was a normal person who runs around the world and does what he wants. When he passed away, the first question when we arrive at the upper court at Beit Din Shalmala is Nasata Venatata Be'emuna. So says the Holy Zohar. Did you deal with people in an honest way or were you corrupted? You stole money, you cheated, you lied, you cut corners. And your son's answer was, 
have the right to remain silent. So that holds in the courts in the United States of America or in Israel, but it does not hold water in the upper courts. Here we know what you have done. You do not have the right to remain silent. What did you do? So he admitted I had to steal and I was cheating the business and I took money that's not mine and I cut around corners very, very sharply. So the upper court said, well, we have to discuss it, consult with God, with Hashem, to know what to do with you. So look, some sins, some evil doings, we can fix them up there because they're only superficial amendments. But some are so deeply ingrained, especially when all the Ten Commandments, don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat. You can't just, you know, get away with murder. You have to make a tikkun, which means you go back to this world and you go against all the motions. You're going to go back into kindergarten, eat your banana, going back into elementary school. And when you come of age, you will be given the same yetzahora, the same inclination. You will want to steal, but this time you won't. Because the, your child begged the higher courts and said, I know myself. I'm so ingrained deeply with my Yetzirah, with my evil inclination. I know that I will sin. I'm not able to hold it back. I have this terrible itch to steal. So do me a favor. Take away my ability to steal. I said, how? Please, please send me with no hands to this world that I have the inkling, I have the itching, but I won't be able to do it. So the higher cause did your baby a favor and they sent him here with no two hands. The father was very quiet. And when the giant of jury, the Chofetz Chaim spoke, he knew that that was the truth. So our physical eyes see an illusion. We think that this baby is a very, very miserable little child was sent with no two hands. How cruel and unfair is God to him? That's our illusion. But the truth of the matter, he asked for his journey, for his tikkun, because he knows he cannot navigate his own evil inclination a different way. So he is the one who forged his way in this world. This is mind boggling, but this is what Kabbalah tells us. And therefore to summarize, the goof, the physical body, whether it's an animal, inanimate, a plant or a human being that speaks, will always be that carrier, that conduit, that pipeline, which shows us exactly where the person is holding now, based on previous lifetimes. We do not see forward towards the next lifetime. Hopefully we won't mess it up. We won't corrupt our ways. If we do, we can also adapt to come in such a way. So Caroline is asking, isn't the child being punished because of the parent or better off as a parent? And the answer is that it's true that the verse says, Avot but it's a question mark. If my parents have corrupted their way, won't I pay for their deeds? And the answer is yes. It's true that till Bar Mitzvah, we do say Bar Mitzvah or Bar Mitzvah say Baruch Sheb Taranu I want to annul and take away and negate all the punishment that my children should have because of my actions. That's as long as they're very, very small. And that's true as well. The question is, why was this father and mother deserving, in parentheses, being cynical, to be sent a child in that form? So obviously they have done something to deserve it as well, no doubt about it. But why the child has to suffer because of his parents' actions? Actions, And the answer is both have to pay. And again, it's not a punishment. It's educational and it's tikkun, it's rectification, rectification for whatever these people that did in this lifetime on a previous lifetime to metakenet hadinim, right? Right? Because of this tikkun hadinim, because of trying to mellow what we call mituk hadinim, to make it much lighter in this way. And I'm sorry, I thought that the chat, can everyone see the chat or is it just me? Maybe it's just me, so I'm sorry. I thought it was everyone can see the chat. And and um, as long as we can do that, we can say, Atat Sadiq, you are a righteous God. 
in everything that comes over me, right, I can see that everyone can see the chat, once I say that, I accept judgment on me. I say, I'm sure God that you are righteous. I don't remember, I don't recall my previous reincarnation, things I've done when I was younger, but I'm sure that if I get it, I deserve it. Again, it's a boomerang effect. I bring it on myself. God is not involved. He's only involved to formulate, to facilitate the spiritual judgment in this world for good or for worse. But he's not the one who's punishing me. I'm the one who's punishing myself. And yes, like one of you have asked, everyone involved has to pay a certain price for things that they have done. This is the first step for today. If you've got a reflection on this, I'd love to hear, and then we can move to the next uh, section. Yes, Shili san I want to add something. Uh, I want to add something. So it's uh, when we say in Hebrew, that's really not a good compliment. And we are so busy with this, this world called Alma de Shikra, Olam Shel Shekir, because we're busy uh, fixing the, the goof, the vessel, uh, externally, not internally, where uh, obviously it doesn't work, uh, or I would say it's not enough to maintain and to sustain and to build happiness. And not pleasure, happiness. So if we understand it's Alma de Shikra and we need goof and Sura, one of the exercises we have in hypnosis and psychotherapy, and when we give and when we see a, or we walk through a challenge, we ask what smell there is, what shape do you see? Because we want to bring it into more a physical manifestation understanding that a person can walk through the challenges. So Alma the Shikra is all about you World seeing the from, seats, a very, right. from a very young age, the challenges, the discomfort, the friction that you are facing right when you came to this world for you, for what? To be awakened. If I, if my GPS tell me, listen, in two miles there's an accident going on, I can say, well, let's keep going. Let's see what the accident is all about. Well, I can say, I can choose a different route. Right. So right. that's right. what right. it's right. all about. And sometimes to be awakened because God is good and because God wants you to succeed, right. he may bring the signs for you to be so obvious that you should not miss it, at least in this height, in this reincarnation. Yes, absolutely. So I just want to add that. So I, I will share with you, for example, I had a patient today with me, Waven, however, right? And she complained heavily, she's a bereaving widow, about the fact that so many things at home go wrong. For example, the timer of outside of all the, the water sprinklers just went out at the 70s, especially now. The nerve with it, that it happened now. So, and she has to pay a few hundred dollars and to bring in a professional. So she really is complaining about it because she, on top of being a widow, you know, when it rains, it pours. But ask her, what is the spiritual message in it? Maybe, maybe God is trying to tell you something. No, he's not fair, but maybe, it's okay. What is he trying to tell me? That you have to reset your time. That for your husband, the time is out, it's done. There's no more time. My father passed away some two and a half weeks ago, which I shared with you last week, and that is, in one his time, he passed away when he was 86, but in one his time, when I'm gonna look at his, the, the watch, he's still gonna be only 86. For him, time stopped. Only for us in this world, time is carrying on. Let's say that in, in many years time, I will also arrive one day at this age of 86. So if I come up there and I'm older than my father physically, so he will say, hey, you old man, in this world, you used to be my, much younger than me. You used to be my child, and now you're older than me? Yes, yes, because in this physical world, he happened to play a role of being a father to me. But as time goes by and we grow older and more mature and more experienced, then we gain more confidence and maturity and responsibility as life goes by. And for us, the age goes on, so the timer is with us. We reset the timer. So any kind of incident, I don't want to call it accident, that happens is never random. Because if it's random, it means that there's no God. It means that everything is chaos. There is no randomality. 
God is infinite enough to make sure you get your lesson. And the bigger the price you pay, the greater the lesson that is involved. He doesn't speak to us, I'm the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt. Look what I want to do in your life. No. The sprinkler, the timer, the lights, the this and that. And through that, right, we can understand. So one of you is asking, right, how can they reset their time? How can we reset our time, their time? And the answer is, for people who passed away, or people that are fixed mindset, or people that do not change, time does not really, there is no reset of time because they are unable to change. People that are fixed mindset, meaning they always see the, way, the world in limited mindsets, which means egotistical or self-centered or victimizing. For them, there is no reset. And even if God sends them different kind of messages, inklings, hints, they don't see it. It passes over them or underneath them. But for people that are listening, for people that are spiritual, the people that want to grow, that's everyone here and everyone later that will receive this link and others, it will always be a message. And this is really the two levels of human beings that we have in this world. This precedes me by 2000 years, what I'm going to say now. The one was Rabbi Akiva, and he said, whatever God does is for the best. Call the Avid Rahmana Letava Avid. This is the, 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 the level of the masses, the mob effect. People that are within faith, people that are within a, a given good level, they will say, I don't understand it. It's beyond my understanding, but I trust that God meant well, even though I don't feel it and I don't see it, I do trust it. It's by my logic. Comes the Rebbe of Rabbi Akiva, Nachum Ish Gamzu, and he says, no, go a higher level. And of course, Rabbi Akiva knew it, but he didn't want to tell it to us because it's for those chosen and say, make time count. Make that lesson count. Don't let it go by unseen, unwatched, random. You know, that snowboy, that burning bush happens to each one of us every day. One day the alarm clock goes off and switches off by itself. One day the lights go off and on in the home. It's, one day things fall off. It happened to me in the kitchen the other day from the aisle. Things, I wasn't there. Think, there was nothing there to move it. Things fell off. If I'm not observant enough, aware enough, things fell off, you know, randomly. But if I said there must be a spirit here, there, there must be some kind of a message. It's up to us to pick up that, that, that ball and to say, this is a burning bush. Some God is trying to tell me something. There's something spiritual here that through the form, through the shape, the spiritual shape, even with art form is being sent to me to understand. And therefore, and therefore just the, the next little step, we've got a double helix, which means like the DNA. One side is the physical. Obviously, God is, was fitting for a little baby, his level of understanding, his maturity, his ability to not to walk, his lack of ability of speaking or to transport himself, his ability is so limited, which exactly responds and corresponds to his physical ability. So God always matches the physical ability to the spiritual ability. As we grow older, so our body grows older and then we can speak, we can stand, we can walk, we can communicate, we can learn, our intelligence, our comprehension goes wider when our spirit and our soul is being more elevated. So this double helix is one is the spiritual shape, the other one is the physical form and there will always be a match between them. It's very rare, we, sometimes we see physical shape and we say, oh, this person must be under great deal of suffering, or this person doesn't have great comprehension, or this person looks to us like a criminal. Whatever it is that we feel and we are certain that this is the truth, because the spiritual enacts itself through the physical till it shows itself completely through the physical. Now we're gonna start a very large section. So if you have any comments till now, any one of the participants, please do share or respond or make a comment. 
Uh, whatever it is, it should be accepted with love. Go ahead. I'm gonna make a public auction, I'm gonna count to three. If you do not respond, it means that you agree. One, two, sold, which means you agree with whatever was said. If you, no response means that the response is that you admit and you agree with what was said. Don't be shy. Well, if, you, if, if you really insist. Um, I insist, I insist. So, yeah. <laughs> so um, body and shape is all about pers 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 perspective, perspective in life. Okay, in life, for God's sake, my English. And it's very good. And, you know, I remember my I remember my grandma. She was uh, older in her older years. She said, "All my life, I was working so hard and was frustrated about losing weight, losing weight. You know, this diet, that diet, that diet. And now, I'm losing weight, and I really don't care." So, so it, you know, our our focus and our manifestation goes where our minds go, and I think big part of the Kabbalah is to and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, or I choose to see it in that perspective, is that us will be in a place where we can lekabel with much see. more grace and kindness. Yes, to receive, uh, because a lot of time we want to receive, but we're not ready to receive, right? So what's the difference is, is wanting is not capacity. It's not capability. And in order to be capable, we need to be trained. So part of the goof and tzura and the study of Kabbalah is to train our mind, train our body, train our view, train our perspective. Because as we know, it's all about awareness and I cannot be aware of something. I don't have the awareness to look for it. So if I'm not aware, I'm stuck in a box. Right. And the whole Kabbalah or any other studies when it comes to what we're learning is to extend and to stretch. In chaplaincy, we call it stretch your soul, stretch your emotions to stretch because you can, you're, you're not growing if you're not stretching. Beautiful. So, so what, beautiful. So one of the participants is asking me through the chat and that is, how can we change a fixed mindset into an open mindset? So this is a very, very challenging question, which have been, uh, a few of us have been really challenged with for the last few weeks and maybe for a very long time. And I scratch my, my, my mind and my brain a lot to facilitate for myself and for others how do we know that? And by the way, Kabbalistically, if you want to check yourself, it's a simple check. This, the top of your thumb, right, or left hand, right, actually reveals your, your flexibility. So if you're able to do that, which means you're able to extend your thumb over and above the 90 degrees, if it's unable to stretch over and above, that it's stuck like this, it means you have a fixed mindset. This is where your starting point is. It's not bad, it's what, what it is. But if you're able to stretch your thumb over and above, this is your willpower. And this is your reason. This is your reasoning, this is your willpower. If I'm able to, with my willpower, stretch my mind, then it's possible. The question is, how can we achieve that? So that's something that I'm busy with quite a lot recently. It's a very good question. And the hum my humble answer is as follows. It's not the only answer, but it's a good answer. Human relationships through respect, dialogue, listening, helps a lot extend our mindset. For example, obviously if something that somebody that I respect, parents, coaches, spiritual leaders, teachers in school, if I listen to them and I have a certain preconception about something, for example, the 19th, 19th I'm, not, I'm not being wrong, the 19th century was called the century with no God. The reason being because Christianity, for example, believes in the fact it's in Christianity. The world is flat. The earth is flat. Came science and said, why now it's really not true. The earth is round. And you know what? The earth is not the center of the world that used to be in the elder, in the ancient world. The sun is the center of, of our, of our planet, planet, planet system. And the earth is goes, goes around. That's why people lost faith because Christianity has failed them with its tradition. When we listen to a teacher who tells, well, my dear girl, my dear boy, this is not flat, he's run, I'm gonna prove it to you, right? The new scientific findings, 
or even extended more than this. I've got a spiritual teacher, a rabbi, and he will tell me, they will tell me that, you know what, what your preconception is, it's not right. You can go over and beyond, for example, your willpower, which we're going to spend some more time with the future in it, comes from the sphere, from the sphere of crown, which means it's over and above your physical limits. Who says this? Says this the Baal Tanya, the one who wrote that book called the Tanya, in a different book, which means I can extend myself over and above my physical mindset. My mindset says I need Nike shoes in order to jump over 15 feet. Came old ladies and children in the Holocaust and jumped 50 feet. Is that possible? No, but they did. How did they do it? Because they opened themselves to faith because they had no other choice. It was either death or survivalship and giving life. So when I have a discussion with somebody that I respect or giving respect to my opponent or to my friend or to anyone I'm in a relationship with, even if it's just a friendly relationship, and trusting that they have a good intelligence and a good incentive and a good intention. And opening myself to listen to them if they are good, respectable people, and they will tell me something which is not in my capacity, not in my culture, not in my mindset, but say, okay, I will accommodate that. That's beautiful. Then you allow your mind to be open. If I immigrate to a different state, to China, to Europe, I listen to a new language, new customs, new culture, new clothes, new tradition, which is foreign to me, but I allow myself to be open to that culture and okay, that culture has been going around for thousands of years, I respect it, right? By the way, in being a chaplain, that's definitely is the basic um, prerequisite of being coming a chaplain, respect, dignity, open mindset to somebody else's culture, religion, tradition, then you are able to extend yourself to a different mindset. And just in a nutshell, because I want to move forward, and it is the Gemara, the Talmud gives a very beautiful story about this that I think one of you at least has heard from me, which is as follows. One of the great Amorim, which was about a generation 2,000 years ago, those that wrote the Talmud, came to another one, another great rabbi, and asked him to learn by him. He said, I want you to go down to my shoe and tie my shoelaces. He says, excuse me, how dare you? I came to learn by you, I'm as great as you. Why do you humiliate me by asking me to tie your shoelaces? He said, listen to me, my friend. You came to learn with me, and from your answer, I understand, you didn't come only to learn with me, you came to argue with me. You have your own mindset. You set on certain things in your own fixed mind from where you came from. If you really want to learn from me and you think that I'm deserving to be your teacher, you need to open your mindset. Therefore, you need to humble yourself, to create a vessel, to lower and limit your ego, to allow somebody else's opinion to be relevant. Otherwise, on everything that I will say, I will have an opponent in my shiri, in my, my lectures, in my dvar, and not, and not a pupil. He went down and he tied his shoelace and became a great student. So to summarize, this is a very important thing and it's very difficult to do, but it can be done and it should be done because that's why Hashem has sent us over here. Now, to understand this, I'm going to go with you now into understanding what are the basic elements that Hashem made this world from. I'm talking about physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. It's going to be very, very simple at eye level. But this division is going to give you an insight, a deep insight, an inkling, an enlightenment into understanding how this world works. Some of it you'll say, well, I know all about it, but let's respect each other to see that some things over here will be a great revelation. A revelation. So some you know, but great part you don't know, right? And I also don't know. So let's learn together. So Kabbalah says, and that comes in many, many shapes and forms, Daria Kodosh Ratit in his books, Bera Abraham Vital, in the introduction to Sefi Yetzirah, the book of creation that was written by, attributed to Abraham our forefather, it's written as well, as follows. All of nature and all of the spiritual world, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically. In other words, when I say on all levels, this is what I mean, is divided into four things. 
which is four elements. And these four elements are fire, air, water, and earth, or soil, whichever way you want to call them. The difference between us, the difference between any form, whatever I look at, look at the plant world, the animal world, the inanimate world, or the, the human world will be in how much of each ingredient is within it. Well, it's very simple, for example, that all the inanimate world, the major element will be earth. It's very simple to us to understand that when it comes to the plant world, the major element will be water because all these plants need a really water to nourish them. They grow from the soil, yes, but they have a need, a great need to water, otherwise they, they wither away. It becomes more tricky when it comes to the animal world. What runs that? What is the major element there? It becomes very tricky when it comes to us. Well, because I'm a human being, so I don't have, I don't have the element of water. Of course, 70% of mine is water. Some say, like myself, it's 72%, which is the geometrical value of chesed. The world was created with chesed, which compassion, kindness, kindness in gematria, in geometrical value in Hebrew, chesed is 72%. Scientists debate if 68%, the geometrical value of chayim, of life, or 72%, I tend towards 72%. So what am I? Am I mostly earth, mostly fire, air? Uh, what am I? So we're going to discuss it now to the point that you will know what is the major ingredients or ingredients which drives you, which, is, which others significantly see that this is who you are. But first, we need to understand the different kind of elements. You don't have to take notes. If you want, you may. You don't need to remember anything. This is not an exam. Just to understand. The spiritual shape, we spoke before about the building elements. We had shape, which is spiritual, and we had physical form, right? The essence, the matter. I look at the stone, right? That part which puts it all together, which looks to me like a stone or a crystal or a mountain or anything else which is inanimate, let's say a coral, right? All of that, the power which puts it all together is called in Hebrew a koach hamechaber, that unification power. In other words, in Israel, for example, you have an advert about the Volvo car, you say it's not any more parts, it's much more just it, than just its part, which is true. I don't want to drive parts of a car. The whole car is much more than the parts. I pay much more for the table that I'm leaning against now than just four legs and a piece of wood on top because it's a, it's a table. I'm not a conglomeration of two eyes, one nose, one heart. No, I'm not the sum of my organs. I'm much more than this because I'm a living human being like you are. So that power that puts it all together in which other ever level, which is inanimate or the plant world or the animal world, or the human world, which we call the speaking world, or Lama Medaber, the speaking world, will be called Koach HaMechaber, which is the dead force which unites all this, which is worth much more than the parts. So one thing you take away from me today, you are much more than the parts which make you. The proof of this is when you go to sleep. When you go to sleep and somebody calls you and says, hey, how are you, how are you, how are you doing? There's nobody there to call because your spiritual form, your spiritual shape, is gone from this physical body. Now, when we look, just a few seconds, bear with me. When we look at that, we see that when it comes, so the, the inanimate world has got only that power, which is called the unification power. Koach HaMechaber. When we come to the plant world, we've got a different spiritual shape, form in it, which is called Koach HaGidul Vatsmicha, that power of making it grow. So, Nothing in the inanimate world seems to grow. A stone is a stone is a stone. It only grinds away with time. It doesn't grow bigger, it doesn't grow bigger. And yet when it comes to the plant world, there's a different extra power there. Not only the unifying power, but also the power of growth. And this power is made up of koach hazan, the nourishing power, right? Because all the leaves, all the trunks, but all the roots are being nourished through the earth. 
It's also Koach HaMegadel, which means it gets empowered and it grows with time. It's not the same plant as yesterday or a week or a year before, right? And it's got another power, which is Koach HaMulik. It's got also the power to give place to seeds, to pollen, to make more flowers, to make more fruits with time, to make more trees. So this is very much becomes much more complicated. The power of the plant world, and you ask yourself, why is he teaching us about the plant world? I thought it's all about Mikabola. So hold on, it's gonna become very, very surprisingly wonderful and exciting. The inanimate world, unifying power. The plant world got unifying power, plus the power to nourish, the power to grow, and the great power to give birth to the next generation after, right? I remember in my house, I used to grow kombucha, which is that, that kind of a mushroom that you grow inside green, green tea and sugar. And one night I came home and I hear terrible shouting in the kitchen. There's nobody here. Who's shouting? What spirit do I have in my house? A ghost. And that she was so happy. She listens to music that mushroom, the kombucha mushroom. She listens to music and she grows and she starts to shout out of enjoyment. I thought I was unique in listening to, no, this is obvious. This is what she does. Even though it's the plant world. When we come to the animalistic world, on top of everything we said, which exists there as well, there's one new power, which is Koach HaChiyuni, that element which gives it life, right? In that element, yes, it's true, animals, dogs, they do have feelings. And yes, they do also have intelligence. The only issue, I would not call it a challenge, I would call it a problem, is that we attribute feelings of a dog to our, to our feelings. I'll never forget arriving in Haifa at a certain lecture, and I had to wait for my lecture to start outside in my car, preparing my lecture. With a certain woman waiting there at the entrance to a building with a dog, Johnny. And for 20 minutes, she was being, oh, Johnny, please, we need to go. It's not time yet. Why are you, why are you being so stubborn? I couldn't, I, I couldn't help but laughing, you know? because that dog has feelings, but it's not human feelings. It's animalistic feelings, because what was the difference? Animals do not have free choice. They don't have moral dilemmas. The feelings are real feelings, but the feelings of a dog. They are much lower than the human kind of feelings. When we feel, we debate, is it love, is it hate, is it compassion, is it kindness, is it cruelty? They don't debate. They don't debate with it. It's just normal instinctual kind of feelings. I'm not negating or taking away their feelings because they do. And if they suffer, we need to take care of their feelings because Tzah Balechaim, taking care of animals, comes in the Torah as a mitzvah from the Torah. And we should take care of the animals that are dependent on us. Before we take care of our needs, if I have a fish at home in an aquarium or a dog or a chicken, it's my responsibility to make sure they get breakfast and they get dinner before me, because otherwise they can die. They can't help themselves, but I can. And they do have intelligence. For example, donkeys are very smart animals, very smart. But can we compare them to human beings? Who's controlling who? Who's putting who in cages? Who is taking who to, to races? Horses, for example. Obviously, human intelligence far by supersedes anything else. So we do not compare our intelligence to that of dogs or cats or anyone else. We do not compare our feelings to that because we have a soul, which we're going to discuss later on, and they don't have a soul. They've got an animalistic spirit, nefesh behemit, but they do not own a soul. To us, it looks the same. We're going to study later, but I'm just going to give you something now. Children, very young children, toddlers and younger, don't have a soul, they don't have a spirit. They only have the same level like an animalistic soul. It didn't come into them yet. And therefore, children dream about animals, they love animals. It's so important for the growth when they're very, very young. But as they grow older and they receive higher parts, they don't need them anymore because it's not the same level. It's not the same match. When a dog cries and a child cries, it's not the same cry. If you have really seriously, if you have a dog at home and your child is crying, who are you going to go to first? The dog that is crying. 
So how do you explain the fact that uh, um, some people can see for on the next, like Volama Asia, they can yes. see animals, yes. right? So if yes. they don't have a human soul, how can they can meet their uh, owners in yes. Olama Asia? Very good, very good question. I will quote for you, I will help you. I will pour some more gas onto that fire. You see that Bilam, Bilam, that was the greatest prophet ever that the Goim ever received because they complained spiritually. And so they say, we need somebody great as, Mo as Moshe Rabbeinu. So they got it. Bilam, he was as great as was it when it comes to the power of prophecy of Nevoah. Nevertheless, when he was in dire straits and his donkey, female donkey, was stuck on the road on the way, she saw the angel of death the angel that was, he couldn't see. So how can an animal see? And the truth is, since we live in Olam Asya, in the lowest world, which we're going to discuss later, animals don't have this buffer. They don't have this filter in the mind as Rebbe Deslev discusses part of the Kabbalah. We have this filter. If I saw all the time ghosts around, as some unique people do, if I saw dead people, dead spirits around, I would become, I would become paralyzed. I wouldn't be able to, I won't, I will lose my free choice. But animals, they don't have free choice anyhow. So God allows them, doesn't, they don't have this filter. Therefore, they're able to see ghosts, spirits, angels, as long as they're in the same world, which is the lowest level, the world of Asiya, the world of action. They're not able to see higher forms. They're not able to see Abraham, our forefather. They're not able to see the divine spirits because that's over and above, as, as we call it in the States, the pay grade. They're not allowed, they don't have access to that. But they do can access spiritual realms. And that's why you will see a dog standing to, in the corner of the room and he's barking at something which I cannot see. Say, so what are you barking at? Or we can get messages from the world of people that passed away. A beautiful white butterfly will come through. A small little bird will come through. And usually that's the soul of the deceased. Animals will feel it. Animals feel the tsunami coming, but we don't because we got detached from our feelings. But people that are, are open to channeling, to spiritual world, the spiritual realm, will feel it not only as animals, but much, much more. And the translation, what it means, will be different. An animal will see a person that, let's say, goes to die. For them, it makes no difference if it's life or death. They see them. First, oh, this is summer that passed. How can I help you? Maybe I should say Mishnah to Leilu Nishmas to for your soul. An animal won't say ahu or meow for an animal that somebody they don't translate it. They don't have any understanding in it. So yes, they can. Yes, they can, but that's because they really physically see because they don't have the filter that we do have in order to protect us. Because if we lived in this world, we will lose a free choice. And for most of us, this world will become like robots. I, I hope that does answer your question. When it comes to the world of the human beings, so we have everything inside us. This is why we learned everything that preceded. We are not disconnected from the inanimate world. We are not disconnected from the plant world or the animal. Everything I mentioned till now, that's the Kabbalah says we have it inside us. We know, and Dr. Shili brings it a lot, is Dr. Amataro. When I say blessing next to water, that water crystallizes differently. But the other way around, if I hurt somebody with my words, the vegetative soul, listen again to the concept, to the term, the, vegeta the plant soul, that part which is comparable to emotions, which is comparable to the ruach, to the element of air, or the element of water, rather, excuse me, the element of water gets out of balance because I've hurt them. Or when I praise them, they get, they, get, they get empowered. So I have got access in every human interaction or experience that I have to touch onto somebody's emotional world, which is merging, which is lined up with the vegetative world very much like a vegetable. So you say, I just spoke to you logically. I just say to you, you're a pain in the neck. Yeah, but you hurt my feelings. No, I just said the logical statement because you do, it's a fact. No, you really hurt my feelings so badly I can't recover. You know why? Because I touched 
on to your vegetative self, your emotional world, which is the element of water which we harbor inside us and everything that comes with it. What did we say? The unifying power, you broke me apart. The power to grow, I can't grow because of your statement. That nourishing part, you're not nourishing me, you're breaking me. Or the third part that we spoke about, the power to give birth. If I write a book or a post and somebody comments and says, ah, speak to English. Oh, you're not good in what you're doing. He breaks my spirit. But I'm so intellectual, I'm so, no. He's touching on an element which is so deeply ingrained. It's subconscious, it's in your subconscious that elements of water which is part of your makeup. That's why many people, elderly people and overseas, they nourish and they grow in the house, especially when they're widowed. Plants, it's like an animal. They water it, they, they pet it, they, uh, they hug it, they nurse it, because for them, this shows us, if somebody has got many plants at home, that they need lots of, they need to touch and to be touched, to nourish and to be nourished and receive, Kabbalah, lots of feelings. The same applies, the same applies to somebody who has many animals around them, etc. They need something intellectual or somebody that will give unconditional love. In Hebrew, we call a dog, Kelev, says the Gemara says, Kulolev. He gives unconditional love. If I say to somebody something and he doesn't like it because he's opinionated, it's going to refute or re rebel against what I say. But an animal won't do that. She will give unconditional love. She will bark to protect me. She will give its life for me. So water is the emotional part of ourselves and the physical animal body is the earth part, right? And yes, this is a very good question. And therefore the answer will be as follows. Let's summarize to make it very, very clear because this is getting too far out. So I want to summarize and reflect with you. That animalistic part, or no, that inanimate part of us, this is inside us called the nefesh and it lines up with the element of earth. When I feel, I'm gonna discuss it next week in, in depth, but when I feel down, when I withdraw, when I feel in bereavement, when I feel in grief, when I feel sad, when I feel lonely, when I feel victimized, depressed, this all comes out from the element of, of earth inside me. It's very, very um, uh, dominant inside me as a human being. When it comes to play and I feel so much drawn downwardly, that is the element of earth. We're going to also understand what is the tikkun. How can I do something about it? I'm stuck with it. No, of course you can do something about it. Just now, we, first of all, we're discussing how does it feel like inside us? It's built into us. The whole world is built. We are microcosm of all the creation, all of the creation, with no exception, inside one body. When it's so comes, I'm sorry. So sure. just to, yeah. I figure I should just probably speak. Absolutely. Type it yes. yes um, so I'm trying to understand what the, you were talking before about what the water part is. And um, so I'm trying to understand what the, you know, if, if, if the earthen part is the downward drawing emotions, yes, as well as the flesh, like the physical flesh, yes. then is water the higher level emotions or the spiritual? Part so, of so, yeah, so, so let's make an order, say again. That element, which is the very physical basic actions will relate to the inanimate or the earth element, as well as any downwards first of, of feeling lonely, sad, depressed, tired, tired of life, grinding of life away, or people that are very, very practical, or people that they talk will be very, very left, left brain, small brain, which means, um, for example, a husband will say to wife, we speak the whole day, we didn't speak today. Yes, we did. I asked you, what did you buy in Walmart? And you said to me that you bought this. You see, we speak the whole day. So we didn't speak a lot at, at all today because that's technical. Technical is the element of it. It comes to the world of emotions. This is the element of water and it accesses different higher part in us. It nourishes, it empowers, uh, it helps us grow inside us as well as unifies. So anytime that I touch on emotions of any person, 
right? Attach on what makes you go, on your great pleasures and inner satisfaction. I love listening to, mu to, to spiritual music, to meditation. Okay, that's great. It, when you listen to music, when you, when you breathe slowly, when you listen to the water, right? When you go and meditate in nature and your feelings become so fulfilled and satisfied, then you're really touching on your elements of water inside you. When you have great nachas and a great enjoyment of what you do, that's the element of when somebody hurts your feelings, somebody criticizes you, somebody negates who you are, somebody calls you a zero, whatever nice words they use. This is bashing and crashing your spirit, which is your emotion, which touches your element of water. We're going to discuss next week, how do we attack in this? How, how, I don't want to be a victim of circumstances or people. I want to be the owner of my own life. When it comes to any kind of dialogue, in a, in a, in a negative way, people gossip, people criticize, people lie, people flatter. When it, there's no place for flattery, there's no place to do it. Oh, you know, you're so great. You are the chief for this. You are the queen of, but you know that you're not. You know, this flattery is baseless. You know that this is real outright lie. Somebody exaggerates, right? I heard from one of my spiritual mentors when I was learning in College of Psychology in Israel, um, one of the ladies they shared, she's a top psychologist. The husband is a doctor of psychology, but he's got a problem. She shared about the husband. She, he's got a problem of exaggeration. They went out down the elevator in Malay Dafna, which is a very posh, expensive neighborhood of Jerusalem. And they weren't speaking this morning. Most of them are elderly. Suddenly a young couple walks into the elevator and then the husband opened his mouth. Hey, husband, who's a doctor of psychology, one of the best in Israel, Frum, says, the 40 million euro that we have in the bank, did you transfer to our child the 20 million? The, 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 you, know, you know which child I mean? The one that lives in England, the one that visited Israel a week ago and we supported him. The woman looks at him shocked. You know, nothing, we don't have 40 million and we didn't give our son 20. But she's shocked, she doesn't say a word, not to embarrass her husband. And so, and what about the two million in francs? Did you transfer it into, into yen? She's shocked. She doesn't know what he's speaking about. Then they come, then the third couple goes out. She says, What comes over you? So oh, now I'm relaxed. Wait, what do you mean I'm relaxed? I had to exaggerate to make some kind of a significant statement that these people living in the same building will know we are rich, we are around. This is a negative part of the element of, of air. The spirit of the person needs significance to the point that they lie, they cheat, they exaggerate, to pump themselves up, even though they don't have any coverage for what they say. In a good way, we have positive dialogue. We support each other. We empower each other. Use our time for Torah learning, for Kabbalah learning. This is a very positive input into feeds directly into our air element within each and every one of us. The highest form is that of the neshama of the soul, which is the, the, the fire element, which means in a negative way, you know, we are, we get very, we are very self-righteous. So very righteous, we like to be right. We don't like to be lied. So many people, when we are lied to, I know myself, I can become angry. I don't like anyone lying to me. Or if I catch myself in my, if I'm lying to myself, or if I live in a lie, if somebody cheated me or, or, or swindled me, whatever it is that makes you very angry. And that anger, that pride, that arrogance comes from the element of fire. How can we, how can we attack in it? How can we rectify this kind of thing? Because it's in every one of us. You know, I saw this in Israel, they, I was part of it. There is a special place where people come for a workshop to get rid of the anger. They place all, all along the walls, these very thick kind of mattresses and people stand there for about half an hour. They eat the best of mattresses and they shut out all the angers all together. Ah, they go wild. And after half an hour, yeah, I'm relaxed. It's kind of a therapy. I don't know that this is actually a rectification of what we need to, but I do know to tell you that that takes out a lot of your anger. To say that there's a revocation, I don't know. To say that it's taking out and releasing your anger, that is true. So to summarize for today, we each have all the four elements inside us. Each one has a role in our lives. 
we need to understand what we have more of, what we have less, what defines us, what we need is challenging us on a daily or weekly basis, such as anger, arrogance, jealousy, temptations, lust, desires, habits, addictions. What is it? We lazy, element of earth, we withdraw, we depressed, we victimize. And through that, through, put, through attaching it to an element, I know which part of my spirit, of my soul, which is a general word, general term, is under duress, is being challenged. And therefore, what can be, what should be my tikunde? And that goes a long way. It's not categorizing, it's defining my different parts, understanding where is my challenge, and going straight and zooming in to, to rectify that. Your reflection. Or statement or whatever you want to share. Before I count to three, because we are the hour is done. So if you want to ask anything, that would be great because it comes in many shapes and forms in our lives in every day. And we all struggle with it. So I'll, I'll, I'll probably contact you separately because I don't, like, this is probably too big to handle at the you know very end of the lesson. But you can ask, you can maybe if you want to share, if it's up to you, if you maybe can ask and we can sure. discuss it here shortly, it's up to you. Yep. So in Bereshit, yes. human beings are formed from earth. Yes. And then of course God breathes life, life into us. But if we're formed from earth, does that mean like, you know, if if these downward drawing emotions like depression and whatever else is that then the basis of our being? Yes. Um, and and you know, just I'm trying to play around with this or or not play around with, but trying to yeah, yeah, play around with it and understand to juggle yeah. with it, understand what is the form. And it's absolutely true. We are formed from the earth, but we must recall and remember that the earth has got the power to nourish, the power of growth, the power to give birth. In other words, even though it is just earth, but nevertheless, it does have a growing power in it. It does have a nourishing power. We can deepen our roots into that earth. So this earth is very, very, very important. But if we look deep, deeper, Kabbalistically, we say as follows. The word in Hebrew for man is Adam, right? Adam. And not in vain does it come from the root of Adama which means you are made from the earth. So Kabbalah teaches us as follows. If we are full of ourselves with the element of fire, which means I'm very haughty, very arrogant, full of myself, the sun shines out of me, right? Then God reminds us and says, look where you come from. You came from the earth, from dust to come, to dust to go. Remember your humble beginnings, don't, don't get ahead of you. You've got a very limited time here and you're just a guest. You came from dust, I made you, and I can just bring you there as well as you can. Just remember spirit. That's the one. So Adam from Loshan, from the analogy of Adama. That's Kabbalah, that's not me. But if a person is humble anyhow, or a person is downtrodden, a person has got some, such low self-image, say, I'm nothing. I, like Moshe Rabbi says, he didn't say anachnu, he said nachnu. Well, who am I? He was even low in his eyes than, than, than the soil, than the earth itself. That's what he says about it. He was low in his eyes than the soil. Who lives under the ants, all kind of creatures, worms. That's what he thought of himself. I don't know how, but it's him. So then God says, you know why it says Adam? For the word Edmelion, you should, you should understand that you should have the analogy to me. You created in God's image. Yes, it's true. Yes, yes, you created in from the earth, but you got a huge, infinite, eternal, infinite, eternal soul, soul inside you, which has got the powers to rise above all that earthly things and take you up to heaven. And but and we got to summarize by this, and I think also Shirley wants to say something that is the Holy Zohar says as follows: How this earth is called? It's called Aritz, from the root rats running. What do we do the whole day? We rats. We run, run, run the whole day. Where do we run to say the Zohar? La Shamaim. Shamaim from the word Shlemut, from the word completion. We run on this earth and most people run in vain because they run to money. They run, like Shuli said before, to all the physical illusion that we have. 
because we've all, we need it. It's the fuel of life, it's money, it's survival ship. But it's not, it never was an end. It was always just a means, but the end is completion of your soul. So always look up to it, to not to Adama. Adama, just to remind you your humble beginning, but to Edmele Elion, how do I resemble that godliness inside me and where should I strive to? I think, I think that's a good beginning, Kerala. Shirley wanted to say something? Shirley said. She can. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just a small sentence because I don't want to open this discussion. But something we said about the mindset and open mindset, closed mindset. Uh, there is nothing to fix when it comes to closed mindset or open mindset. It's to understand the starting. Every method of growing, if it's coaching, intervention, healing, uh, right? All of that, it's all about starting to understand, first of all, a realistic understanding. Where do I start? What is my beginning? Because right. uh, uh, somebody with a very closed mindset could be a very good CEO, right? So if we navigate the starting point towards Yetzali Yetzira, we create with that, you are actually accomplishing your life purpose. So the Kabbalah is to create a vessel to know yourself, to be able to navigate yourself as a whole plea and to do the best you can in your Gilgul. The problems start when we start comparing to X, Y, Z and seeing all the faults we have rather than say, okay, this is what and we say, this is what we have and with this we're gonna win. And, and sometimes that's, not sometimes, most of the time that's good enough, it's that embracing that has been strengthened because our strength, our strength is very different from each other. And whatever is strength in mine might be defined as yours, but it's not because my so, starting point is different. So let me let me empower one second what you said. Let me challenge you on one thing and we're going to, it has to be really discussed in the future as well. In this Gilgul, in this reincarnation, okay. that is one, the Gemara says exactly empowers what you say. It says, if I was born with lots of fire, so I will have to be either a sheikh at the slaughterer, right? A Jewish kosher slaughterer of, uh, of animals, of chickens, or I will have to be a moral, somebody who circumcises in Greece, or a surgeon, but I cannot change who I am. I will have to work with some kind of blood, nurse, doctor, surgeon, whatever. In other words, I'm not gonna try to be RT because I'm not. This is who I am. This is this is my channeling, this is my limitations. With this, I have to work and 10 years later, like you said. But in that very definition, the same breath, if I am fixed mindset, and this is my yetzer, and I want to turn into yetzer, like exactly what you said, somewhere I will have to have an open mindset because I don't see that that way is conducive for me. You'll have to convince me and show, not only convince me that this way is correct, you'll have to open my mind and say, well, turn this into creation. The no, you can't open your mindset. Yeah, but if I will turn into creation, that by definition is already opening my mindset because I don't I don't have to see anymore in my limited way. Or if I punch him in the face, gonna work. No, let me turn it into karate. Let me turn it into some some something which is conducive. Let me teach other people, you know, something even a physical form, and that that actual learning and creation, to my humble opinion, seriously, and the the accentuation is on humble is already opening his mindset to something that he's not used to. Don't you, do you agree or, or not? Maybe Shirley San cannot speak because she's with people. Sorry, yeah. I was the one. No, no, it's okay, um, it's okay. You cannot change a closed mindset to an open mindset. You can stretch it. And the way to stretch it is establishing a starting point and then have a stretching goals. And, and with that, you can work. Uh, eventually it will be stretched to a point where it's significantly different from the starting point. But you can't make black white and you cannot make white black and you cannot make someone that is earth to be water, but you can stretch it to embrace and to become more than the starting point. Okay, so I stretch my mind to hear you and we will summarize and all agree that all life matters. Good evening to you yes. all. <laughs> we will see each other next Thank week. Thank you. Same time, same place. Bye bye. Shabbat shalom. Bye bye. Shabbat shalom.